Hello, and welcome to the Artificial Podcast, with your host Nick Myers. Artificial Intelligence. Voice Recognition. Machine Learning. Robotic. Actionable Analytics. It is Nick's goal to help everyone understand how AI and voice technology are reshaping our lives both personally and within organizations. Your glimpse into the growing world of AI and voice first starts now. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Welcome to the Artificial Podcast. My name is Nick Myers, and I am here to help break down topics in emerging technology, artificial intelligence, and voice assistant tech to help everyone understand how these technologies are impacting our lives both personally and within our organizations. The Artificial Podcast is brought to you by Red Fox AI. Red Fox AI helps give brands a voice by leveraging the power of AI and voice assistant technologies like Alexa and Google Assistant. If you or your organization is interested in sponsoring an episode, please send an email to the artificial podcast at redfox-ai.com. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere that you stream podcast episodes. You can also follow the artificial podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube by searching for the artificial podcast. You can join our brand new Facebook group exclusively for listeners of the show, where you can meet other artificial podcasters from around the world who are interested in emerging technology just like you. A link to our Facebook group has been included in the episode notes. Thank you for listening, and now a quick word from our sponsors before we jump into this week's episode. Hey, Brett, you know something that has really been bothering me lately? What's that? Well, ever since the pandemic began, grocery shopping has just become a chore. You know, sometimes I just need the basics and don't always want to have to run to my local grocery store, putting myself and others at risk of catching this virus. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, These days, I really try to avoid grocery shopping unless I absolutely have to. Um, I just wish there was a way to get the basics I needed delivered right to my door. Well, Brett, I think I may know of a new service that can help us both with this problem. Have you heard about Blue Fox Box? Blue Fox Box. Hmm. Uh, I can't say that I have. Can you tell me a a bit more about it? Sure, it's actually really cool. With Blue Fox Box, you can order the basic groceries that you need when you need them delivered right to your door. The neat thing about Blue Fox Box is that the items in their boxes never change, so you always know what you're getting every single time, which helps save you time from having to pull up a mobile app, individually select each item that you need, and then check out. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, and even better... You can order your Blue Fox box just by asking for it using Amazon Alexa and soon Google Assistant. Imagine placing an order for the groceries that you need in under 30 seconds and having them delivered to your door in one to three business days. Okay, that sounds pretty sweet. How can I learn more about placing my first order now? Well, you can learn more and place your first order by heading over to bluefoxbox.com or by saying, Alexa, launch Blue Fox box using any of your Alexa-enabled devices. Wait, Alexa. Or me a Blue Fox box. Well, that was quick. Blue Fox box. The groceries that you need when you need them. Now available exclusively in Madison, Wisconsin. Hey there, Artificial Podcasters. Welcome back to another week and another episode of the Artificial Podcast. This week, I am excited to have a conversation with Nick Saka from NES Voice Skills. And Nick Saka, a little bit about him, is a 19-year veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard and continues to serve his country proudly. Nick found his passion for Amazon Alexa back in December of 2014 when Alexa was first released for beta testing. In 2017, Nick made the jump into voice app development and to date has currently published over 400 That's right, 400 Alexa skills for small and medium-sized businesses. That's an achievement all in itself. Nick is actively pursuing title of, or the official title, rather, of Alexa champion for the 2021 selection. Nick, welcome to the Artificial Podcast. How are you? I'm doing great, Nick, and uh, thanks again for having me aboard. Absolutely, and thank you for reaching out to me. And I know, I I, I think we kind of had some brief discussion before we, you know, we kind of officially had our our pre podcast checks. I think you and I both attended one of the voice lunch sessions, um, definitely a couple weeks ago now. And I I personally have found a lot of value in those because they connect me with people like yourself. 
Yeah, I think they're great. And I think, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of growing right now. You know, you, if you see on LinkedIn, there's like, uh, like a Spanish version now, a U.S. version. Yep. So I think those are great because it, you know, there's so, you gain so much from a video conference, you know, Absolutely. people's mannerisms, you get to, you know, see what they look like. Uh, and um, it's a good thing. Yeah. And I mean, especially in a time like now where even though, of course, to those of us or in your case, you know, having worked in this for so long and me just the past three, four years here, we, of course, have seen a lot of development in the space. But if you're somebody from the outside looking in, this is still so early. And I think we have to remind ourselves of that sometimes with having a lot of these discussions in something like Voice Lunch, where everybody from around the world can get together in a place just to share ideas and uh, maybe put some things into action, I think is insanely valuable. But yeah, I think the connection part of that, you know, how you and I got connected, I, I think is fantastic. So, but to, uh, to kick things off here, how did your fascination with voice, specifically Amazon Alexa, begin? And what led you to pursue voice app development? Well, I think I've always had a, a kind of a, um, a knack for computers and, the, and, you know, the way they worked and mm -hmm. programming. And, um, you know, it all started whenever I seen that commercial of the family sitting around and asking them, you know, what the largest mountain in the world was and stuff like that <laughs> back in, uh, back in, uh, 2014. Yeah. And then, um, and then I got invited to, uh, beta test one of the devices and then fell in love with it from there. And, you know, the interesting thing was, is that before the skill store, it was just like a, like a page on Amazon's website and you could just enable these different skills. And there was only mm -hmm. like 20 of them. And uh, I thought to myself, man, that'd be cool to design one of those. So uh, whenever they came out with the SDK, I kind of just threw myself in it, deep dived into it. And, um, you know, I consider myself to be relatively knowledgeable at it. And, um, you know, I, I, I just enjoy it. I find it to be so much more uh, fun than developing for the other voice platforms, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I would say, and I, I really like how your journey began with Alexa, because that's honestly really how mine did as well. And before we even broke into Google Assistant here at Red Fox AI, we were working predominantly with Alexa. So I, I would agree with you. I, I think, you know, I remember reading their ASK and the developer kit, you know, early on, and I remember it making a lot of sense. And they do provide a, a lot of different tools for developers really and of course you know there's arguments on both sides whether you know they could always add more features or people want this but i think at the state it's at now where it seems like the amazon alexa team is just trying to make sure the thing functions i think the development tools <laughs> let's just say they're good enough for right now um they, they are and you know speaking of development tools one of the ones that i'm actually going to create a post on here is the intent history because if you take a look at your skill and like sort of the analytics, you'll see like the majority of the time you're probably getting a lot of fallback or help because mm -hmm. somebody's saying, somebody's saying something that just isn't jiving with your dialogue model. Well, the intent history now gives you the ability to, to dial into that and see what those people are saying. And then mm -hmm. based off of that, you can kind of like pre-stage those into the right intents yeah. to where you can bring that whole fallback uh, percentage down dramatically. And I think that's going to, that's a huge benefit to anybody who's developing for voice. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something new. I didn't even know what you just explained there. I actually wasn't even quite familiar that that, that was actually something that could be done right now. So yeah, feel free to, to write that and I'll take a look and, and share that out because I think um, any little intricacies that people like yourself or others who are really, really involved in the development aspect of this can provide to other folks, I, I think is super valuable. So when you build an Alexa skill, do you, do you, do you do you like it from coding or do you use a tool or kind of what does, what does your process look like? Because I know in our initial discussion, you told me of course that you're self-taught and um, everything that you've learned, you've, you've kind of taught yourself. So what, what does kind of your process look like for developing an Alexa skill right now? So um, if I'm doing it for a client, I'll have an initial uh, meeting and mm -hmm. we'll kind of lay the groundwork of what they want. And from what I found out that the majority of the clients really don't want uh, something very elaborate. They just yeah. want something that has some sort of call to action or presents some sort of value to their customer. So at that point, I'll go ahead and make some initial notes and try to formulate a 
a tree, like a dialogue tree. Yep. And then I'll try to map that out using, um, <clears throat> using like a series of uh, templates that I've designed for myself mm-hmm. through using, using Node.js and then kind of like piecemealing that and then coming up with a, a demo and allowing them to see it and then bringing that all together in a, in a, in a final product. So it's really like a, like a three to four step uh, scenario or uh, process. And I always, I kind of equate it to, you ever see the movie Jerry Maguire, you know, where yes. he's like, he's like all on Cuba Gooding Jr. Well, I kind of, I kind of want to do, I kind of like having that same relationship with the people that I'm creating skills with. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. You know, like, Hey, okay. Does this sound good? Well, I really don't like that. Okay. Well let's change it. What do you, you know? Yeah. So that that's sort of like the, the philosophy that I've adopted. Like I'm, I'm helping them expand their brand. So for me, I have to be as close to what their expectations are as possible. Yeah. And I think right now too, that flexibility is important, that flexibility is important rather because, you know, even people we've talked to and clients we've had, you know, that right now this is like so over so many people's heads who of course aren't really familiar with the technology, how it works and you know, what goes into actually developing an Alexa skill or a Google action or any voice app. So I really like your approach that keep it flexible and that, you know, if you're a developer listening to this, always keep that in mind because, you know, to your point, Nick, I, I think people are looking for just simple things right now. You know, we will get to the point where they can probably be more elaborate and, and there will be a high need for that. But right now I think simple is better, especially for people who aren't working in it. So what is, your experience been like then teaching yourself everything that you know about Alexa and what are some hurdles that you've had to overcome in that process? Well, it's a lot of trial and error. You know, I think uh, you're going to, you're going to make mistakes. And um, for me, what I do usually is I'll take a look and see if there's any sort of tutorial or any sort of community outreach pertaining to what, what I'm doing, whether Mm -hmm. it's uh, session attributes or, accessing the customer uh, information API, you know, uh, or the reminders API, which was a new one to me um, just recently. But the whole thing is, is that, you know, and this is kind of like off the question, but the Amazon group development group is so out there. There's such of a community outreach that -hmm. it makes it very easy to get the answers to the questions that you need. Whereas if you're developing for like another platform, it's very hard to find those sort of resources. And I owe a lot of my success to not only the the fellow champions, but other developers within the, within Mm -hmm. the community. Um, And I think, uh, I think it's a testament to how, how close knit they are and how much these people want it to succeed. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, Mark Tucker, who I actually had on the show a couple of weeks ago, um, I feel like I learn something from every time he makes a tweet. He's somebody that yeah. he's somebody that I I often mm-hmm. actually try and message and say, "Hey, do you have any info on this, or have you seen anything on this?" Because he he opens up a lot of different feature tickets and different things, and Amazon always seems like they respond to him, or he actually you know has some pull to get things to happen. So I agree with you that there are you know, some, some different people within this community who are developers and, and, you know, even looking at the Amazon Alexa team themselves are, are open as they can be at this point with trying to add new features or help people solve problems, or, you know, maybe there's something that you want to do that you can't necessarily do, but there's a workaround. So I think that's, that's a really good perspective to have and would agree with you that right now, it is easy to kind of contact some of these people at, at Amazon. And, you know, hopefully that doesn't change in the future as things grow. Um, but I agree with you 100% on that right now. Yep. So what do you think being recognized as an Alexa champion means? And why are you so determined to pursue this recognition right now? Well, I think it has to do with a little bit of validation, you know, because I've always been sort of in the uh, community. Uh, you know, I used to have my own podcast and, and that got to be a little bit too much with, uh, current workloads and whatnot, but I really enjoy the platform and I enjoy people getting the most out of their smart speakers. So whether it is them trying to set up multi-room music or pair two speakers together, I just want to educate people and let them know, Hey, look, it does more than just weather and music. You know, you could do so much more with these devices. And I think, 
um, through the efforts that I've made, not only on the development side, but also on the social side that, you know, I would be a good candidate for that. And I would continue to, you know, champion the, uh, the brand. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee maybe that at some point um, with how ingrained you are in the Alexa ecosystem, do you think that we're going to get to a point where it does break free of just smart speakers and maybe we start seeing Alexa more ubiquitous? And and I know we're already seeing that, you know, and like, um, of course you got the fire TV stick, you have some microwaves, you have some different appliances and different things, but do you see on the whole, Alexa kind of breaking free of the hardware and just becoming more ubiquitous as a conversational AI. What are your thoughts you know, on that? You know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit 1984 ish, but I've always, env- <laughs> I've always, envisioned, that's, a good, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. I've always, I've always envisioned a future where I could walk down the street and I would love to see this and like talk to a lamppost and be like, Hey, what, you know, what's the weather? And you know, the lamppost would talk back to me. I mean, I think that, you know, eventually we'll end up getting there where a lot of these uh, devices will just have this voice tech ingrained into the infrastructure, whether it is, uh, you know, a lamppost or, you know, going and, and, you know, going to the store. And it it doesn't mean you have to take away somebody's job in order to Mm -hmm. do this. It just means that this is sort of an augmentation to what we're already doing. Right. And, that's sort of, and, and that's sort of like the way I feel about the whole voice, the voice realm itself, right? So you have a business, business has a website, you can order things from a website. Well, the voice app isn't going to replace that website. It's going to augment that website. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe for those who are, who are visually impaired, maybe, you know, a, a myriad of things. But regardless, I just feel that it's a it's the next level of augmentation to uh to commerce and to information delivery yeah and i know uh, you and i'll probably be talking about accessibility and usability in a bit here but i agree with you and i think that's maybe one of the holdups for some people in business or some people who are outside of the voice industry thinking that oh this is a whole nother new thing we have to learn and it's going to change everything that we do and all and you know to some extent they're right it is going to change a lot but I agree with you. It's going to augment the current process. It's going to augment the current way that we interact with technology and really just make it easier. I mean, I I can't tell you how many times I find myself using voice to text on my iPhone more than ever now because I'm just so sick of typing on a tiny little keyboard. I mean, it, it, when you really think about a QWERTY keyboard on a phone, that, that was not designed with a human outcome in mind. It's kind of ridiculous that, you know, we've, we've been doing that for so long, but when you throw a voice into the mix there, it becomes so easy. And especially for someone like me, who, when I do type out a text message on my iPhone, I'm like, I, 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 like I'm a real stickler for grammar. So if I'm a spell something or capitalize a letter that shouldn't be capitalized or vice versa, I then go back and like, I just have this compulsion to fix it, which takes more time when you're writing something with your voice in a text message, you know, it, it typically gets it. I find about 95% of the time. So it's even just really simple things like that, that are augmenting the current process. I don't know if you've had any similar experiences there. Oh yeah, I I couldn't agree more with you. I think that um, I think that the voice recognition software, even if it's uh, from Surrey or Google or Amazon, it's it's there about ninety five percent. It just needs those fine tweaks, and um, I think once it gets there, it, it's you know you're not going to have to type out a text anymore. Oh yeah, <laughs> and I I think I think that's what all of us are are hopefully waiting for as the years roll on here that the natural language processing engine and the automatic speech recognition engine that these different voice assistants have, we'll get to that point where they can contextually understand what we're saying versus, you know, just kind of matching speech to text to pre-programmed stuff where, you know, we can still develop for it and all these different things, but it, it is truly going to be like we're having a conversation with another human being. I, I personally cannot wait for that. And I think that's just going to usher in a whole new era of this tech, but I digress. So, Given that you've developed over 400 Alexa skills now, what have been some of your favorite Alexa skills that you've developed so far and why? So I think, uh, well, number one is the one that I'm recently having a lot of success with, uh, and that's uh, historical voices. And I'm a big believer in, you know, if you don't learn from the past, you're destined to repeat it. And so I wanted to design a skill that would essentially allow people to hear not like famous quotes but 
important moments in history mm-hmm. in the in the author's voice. So like MLK, you know, I have a dream and uh, Winston Churchill, the finest hours, uh, things like that. So I created Historical Voices, which has uh, a broad category of um, inspirational leaders, uh, U.S. presidents, uh, events, like certain events, and uh, also sports leaders. And that's one of the ones that I'm most proud of because it, it's, also, it's cool to listen to these people in their own voice, but it's also, it's also interesting to educate people on like what the – what the mindset of these people were when they were making the speeches and like what the, what their voices actually sound like. And I think it brings it all around and wraps it up into a nice little package. Yeah. I I remember you telling me about this too, in our our conversation we had a couple weeks ago and uh, that one really sticks out to me. I, I really like that. I mean, one, I'm a history buff, but two, I mean, think about how many important quotes were given by people in history that have really impacted life up to the point that it is now you yep. know and and one thing that crossed my mind as you were explaining this here and something that i'm curious of asking if you're fine with it given you know as we're recording this podcast we're currently dealing with of course the conversation of race again in the united states and everything that's been going on have you noticed an increase in access to your skill of people maybe listening to some of these voices of the past for for guidance or any information what have what have you noticed recently you know what's interesting, and this actually happened yesterday. Uh, I can tell you. Um, oh, I went and I started looking at the statistics. There has been a steady increase, um, but as always, you know, you we've run into this problem in the voice uh, realm of driving people to the skill, yeah. right, and making something that's uh, rememberable so that they will come back and use it again. But for some reason. Yesterday in Canada, we had an explosion. Like we had uh, really, yeah. That's in interesting. Two hundred and seventy-six uh, skill activations. Wow. Uh, over four hundred sessions and about sixteen hundred to eighteen hundred utterances. So people wow. were using this, and it was amazing. And um, and yeah, it's uh. It was good. I was I was pretty proud of it. I'm thinking to myself, holy cow, did somebody break their device and just leave it on all night? Like, what's going on here? You know, like, because it's such of a huge spike, you know, I could see an increase. In, in Canada, percent. nonetheless, too, which I find yeah. really interesting. Yeah. But, you know, we uh, that that skill does do fairly good. I think it's number four in education and reference. And um, in, in all of the five U, uh, five English speaking languages. Um, it, it ranks within the top 10 of education and reference, but yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of it. Um, another skill that, you know, I'm proud of as well is, uh, dear Santa, uh, which is a, um, a holiday skill for kids Mm -hmm. and essentially it allows kids to make a wish list and then it allows the parents to check that wish list and, you know, make sure they're, um, you know, they're checking that list twice but the cool <laughs> but the cool part about it is is that the entire skill is done in santa's voice that's awesome so yeah so unless you ask for a fact then he says something like oh here's a great christmas fact and then it breaks to her voice and then he comes back on and says oh wasn't that interesting but about 95 percent of all interactions are done by voiceover and i wanted to create an experience so where a kid could be like oh my god like that's you know, that's the man. That's you know? Santa in, in, my, yeah. in my Amazon Echo speaker. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, for me, Christmas was such of a, an important time, it, and it still is in, in my household. But whenever I was growing up, it was very a very um, important time of the year. And I just wanted to be able to share that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with everybody else. Wow. Yeah. Those, I, I remember you telling me about the Dear Santa one too. And I'm like, man, if I was a kid and I had access to something like that, I would be freaking out. I'd be so excited. Like even to think that I actually was having a conversation with Santa Claus, like that's, that's really cool. No, I, th- I think those are two really good examples that you shared and you know, they're, they're both kind of fun and in their own little unique ways, solve a problem, you know, I think in the moment for somebody, which, which plays into my next question here. So when you decide to build an Alexa skill, what, what is your focus or motivation do you find? You know, is it consistently the same? Does it shift? Are you always trying to solve a problem? Are you creating it for more and just a, you know, just for fun capacity? What, what does that look like? 
Great question. Um, I think that what you have to do, and I've, I've said this a lot, you have to figure out what she can do and then find out what she can't do and then build a skill around what she can't do because she can do a lot of things. Like she can give you a random quote uh, from Martin Luther King, or she can give you a random fact about, um, you know, uh, you know, the war of 1812, but she's not going to be able to provide you with the audio clip of Martin Luther King saying that, Mm -hmm. or at least to my knowledge. So what I do is I create, I try to say, what can't she do and how can I incorporate that into this skill? What's going to make it stand out? What's going to keep it away from the pack? And then I, and then I build around that. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good way to approach it because even we have, we've, as we've built some things, I think we get these glorious ideas of what we want to do, but then, you know, we don't necessarily consider, all right, well, there, there still is only a, a certain point you can go to with building something for Alexa or Google Assistant or Bixby right now, right? So then, unfortunately, sometimes we've got caught in the trap of, oh, wait, we planned out this whole thing we want to do, but now we can't do that yet. And maybe we've told somebody we could. <laughs> only happened a couple of times, but yeah. <laughs> um, so that's why I think the way that you approach it, where you consider what the technology can do first before you design what you're building. I think is a, a really solid approach to that. And I would encourage a lot more people to start thinking that way, myself included. I might have a quick chat with my CTO about this here after we're done, <laughs> we're done recording and because that's something we probably need to get in the habit of doing more as well. But I, I really like that. Exactly. And I'm also looking at it from an angle of, you know, Amazon has a good, has a track record of, you know, increasing her capacity. But in the sense of increasing the capacity, it's almost like uh, cannibalizing some portions of the skill store. You right. know what I mean? So that's when, I, so whenever I say, you know, think about what she can't do, that's sort of what I'm getting at as well. Like what is going to bring that extra value? And no matter how hard, like say, you know, Amazon or Google tries that they wouldn't be able to necessarily replicate what you're trying to put out there. Yeah. So what are, what are some advice, tips, tactics, or strategies that, you can share with someone who may be listening, who is seeking to start developing voice apps or what are some different resources that you have found to be the most valuable as you were teaching yourself? Well, I think, uh, GitHub is an amazing resource for any, for for anything, for anything, Alexa, to be honest with you. And, um, I also think that reaching out to the, the developer community, you know, I have a few developers, you know, people like Mark Tucker, uh, people like uh, Steve Tr- uh, Treningus from Dabble Lab, people who like I kind of, I kind of, you know, look up to in a sense of, you know, um, of building these voice apps. And, you know, for me, uh, I find that person in the community that will kind of allow you to, to, ask them questions. And I think that's the biggest thing, you know, reach out, don't be afraid to reach out and don't be afraid to fail. I think a lot of times people will be like, Oh, I can't do that. I don't know what's going on there. Like, no, if you can follow a 25 minute YouTube video, (laughs) you you can get started. And that's what people have to understand, but you've got to want it. You know, you've got to want, want to be part of it. I actually read something funny not too long ago. I think it was a meme or it was something, but it was like what people, it was, it showed a picture up top. It was like what people think people who work in IT do. And it just showed the person in the picture, just like lines and lines of code on the computer. But then the picture (laughs) below, it was like what IT people actually do. And it was like a forum on Google or something or GitHub. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yep. I thought that was so funny because I feel like that's my CTO and other friends that I have at work in IT even myself included, it's just constantly reading forums and and seeing what somebody else has done. And I tell you what, there is a forum for everything. And somebody else has always figured out probably the problem that you're having. There is a very slim chance. I personally found that they haven't. So I think you're spot on there that if it, all it takes is you wanting to learn it because the resources are there. I mean, heck our, my CTO, Brett, he essentially learned how to do all this stuff kind of the same way you did by just watching YouTube videos, taking some online courses, different things like that. So you, you want to, if you want it, you got to do it. Um, and that, and then it boils down to that, I think. Exactly. It, it, you know, it's definitely a need. 
for sure. So what do you think the biggest challenges that the voice technology industry faces today and how do you think it can be overcome? I think a lot of it probably comes down to visualization. Like I've, you know, I've said this before, right? Um, if whenever you look at the, you know, the, the, the voice spectrum, um, people reach for their phones and they may have 10 to 15 apps on their phone that they consistently use where they mm -hmm. probably, where they probably have a hundred on their phone. They, people in the voice field have to do a better way of marketing their skills, mm -hmm. Yep. but also creating a visual component with that to where it's something that they could see, something that they can hear, something that they could even possibly touch but something that will entice people to come back and make it one of those top 10 or 15 skills that they consistently use. Right. And I think that's a problem that we, that we have in the voice and the voice world. Like for me, going back to historical voices, every time I update that database, I'm blasting out a, a social media post. Hey, I added these guys these guys and girls. And then that way people are like, Oh shit, I'll go check that out. I haven't yeah. used that in, you know, two months. So I think a lot of it has to do with that marketing aspect. Of Absolutely. It. And I think it's about building a community as well. And I think that's one of the unfortunate mindsets that a lot of developers that I've encountered in this space still have. It's kind of the, if you build it, they will come field of dreams mindset. Well, not always, you know, there, there yeah. needs to be a degree of, of marketing and, and giving people a reason why to use it. You know, it, it's, you know, it's one thing to just build and publish something for the sake of doing it, but you know, there's gotta be kind of a unique reason for them to keep coming back to build that habit. And I actually interviewed uh, Sarah Andrew Wilson from matchbox.io a couple months ago and mm -hmm. one of their tactics that they've used is they've created a Facebook group for question of the day. And I think it yes. has like 18,000 people in it. I mean, that's crazy. Um, that's but that's 18,000 people that every time Sarah or anyone else on her team posts to an update related to question of the day or something, those people see that. And, and they go and they, and they use that skill. Yeah. And, and then the word of mouth happens and more and more people use it. So I, I agree with you completely. You know, it's, it's not an, if you build it, they will come with voice specifically. It is, if you build it, you must market it and you must make it good. <laughs> and, and then they might show up. <laughs> right. And then they might show up, yep. but if it's good enough and there's a reason to keep coming back, kind of like with historical voices, as you're telling me here, people will use it and they'll become in the habit of using it. Like, you know, it actually took me quite some time to get into the habit of, listening to flash briefings every morning. Um, I yes. have an Amazon Echo in my bathroom. And I'll be honest, I listen to the news and stuff while I'm taking a shower because it's right there. So, you know, why not digest some stuff while I'm, I'm in the shower? Well, it actually took me a while to, to start listening to flash briefings, one, even though I own the devices for probably a year, but two, just to find ones that really spoke to me. But now it's become a habit. Now I feel like if I'm taking a shower in the morning and I'm not listening to my flash briefings, like something's wrong with my day. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, yeah, you've, you've actually made it a part of your daily workflow, which is great. And I think a lot of, a lot of other people should do that too, because I mean, you could get all the heavy hitters on there. You can get your CNN, your Fox news, whatever you want, but there are a lot of like niche flash briefings out there oh, yeah. that, don't, that don't really get any love and they really should. Yeah. The two and, that, that I specific, yeah. so my, the way my mind goes down the line is I have NPR kind of give me the news and then. I go into uh, Dave Kemp's uh, Future Year Radio because he always talks about some really interesting things as it relates to the voice industry. And he always uh, always kind of showcases some different people that I wouldn't even otherwise consider looking up or trying to connect with. And then followed mm -hmm. by that, I'm a bit of a, a video game nerd in the wings. So I listen to Adrian Simple's uh, Gaming Observer and he does a super good job. Um, yeah, that's I don't know a big one. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if you've checked his out, but he does an amazing yep. job with the Gaming Observer, and then he does the Gaming Observer after show, and it's just so well done. But that's kind of my series of the ones I listen to, and it's just so habitual to me now. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That Gaming Observer, it's definitely an elite, an elite uh, flash briefing. And um, you know, I don't consider anybody any primary ones, like you know, the CNN and the Foxes as being elite. Yeah. Because they're, they're standard, you know what I right. mean? Like you're, you're kind of, you can go to that and get what you want, but that is in a category all of its own that, yeah. um, 
and he he rocked it too. He he transformed his. I actually uh, this um, as we're recording the episode that's out this week is a uh, Adrian Simple's episode, and he dives into just how his um, passion for video games just kind of evolved into this this flash briefing and how it's grown, and it, it's a really interesting story. But um, yeah, I mean it, it's all about building a habit and circling back to your initial point, marketing and building a community. And that's, that's the case with any product. You even look at any software as a service product, aside from voice, it's the same thing. You still have to market it. You still have to find your audience, you know, that the same principle applies to voice. So I, I really think you're spot on with that challenge. And I think we all can do a bit better at, at marketing and, and driving awareness. And that's one of the reasons why I created a YouTube channel. Um, I created a YouTube channel. It's any voice skills or NES voice skills. And the reason why I wanted to create this is because, again, uh, you know, I just felt that people were doing the music and the weather thing. And I wanted to show people like every single menu inside of the settings section of the mobile Mm -hmm. app. Like, here's what you would do to set up you know, directions and weather for your workplace, which is needed. Uh, Yeah. Which is needed. (laughs) And then, and then on the other hand, I said, okay, well, let's expand this a little bit more. What about skills, you know, and you know, the heavy hitters, again, question of the day, they don't need me to do a video review, but people like the cursed painting, uh, from a wonder wonder word, they need me to do a video on theirs because it's at the top of the charts and it's one of the one of the top skills and it's an RPG adventure. But eventually those skills will get swapped out and eventually they will, you know, recede a little bit in usage based on the fact that they're not on the the, the marquee. So for me, I wanted to have a place where people could get the word out about their about their skills and also provide that visual representation. Yeah. of what is going on on a display device because i think that's the biggest wasted space of real estate and voice are those display devices i can't tell yeah. you how many how many games i've played where it's just the the uh skill logo and it's like come on guys like <laughs> yeah there's there's so much real estate you know both on the echo show and the google nest hub and some of these other visual devices and yeah, I think everybody, <laughs> if I had to take a guess, is still wrapping their heads around just the voice only stuff. But when you really start translating that into the multimodal experience on these visual devices, it just adds a whole new layer and, and element to it that, you know, you, again, you have the visualization of it. So you have a visual identifier and you add that additional component and layer on top of it. And that I think just resonates a lot more with people because we've been so used to visual for, well, really since you know, the graphical user interface on a computer and before that with command lines. So, yep. <clears throat> exactly. Um, so if you were to sit in a room with members of the Amazon Alexa team, what are the top three features that you would request as a developer? Oh God. Um, <laughs> I know the list is probably endless, so, right? Put you on the spot. So, Like um, definitely the emails for certification mm-hmm. to go to somebody else because I've had, I don't want to have to annoy a customer right? and be like, Hey, can you send me that certification email? Because I screwed something up. I want to be able to go and put that either have that in the developer console where they say what's wrong or they send an email to another yeah. email address that is also specified or could be specified from right. the developer. Well, console. Because at this point, like, you know, they have to assume that there are companies out there building this stuff for other people to, to try and generate businesses. So I, that, that to me is a feature that I'm actually surprised hasn't happened yet. And I would like to see that as well. And good. And the surprising thing is, is that Google does it like Google, like Google actions. If you screw up one of your, one of your actions, it will then appear in the developer mm-hmm. console and it'll say you know the reference and what it didn't do what it needs to do and what you know and stuff like that so yeah um it's it's interesting that google hit the nail on that head but amazon didn't follow suit yeah i i would say that is definitely a top feature that i i hope they they consider soon i i did have you uh, i know you can there's like a, a feature request thing i know mark tucker's on it plenty of times have yeah you, have you done a feature request for that yet or just kind of I holding have. out <laughs> I have, and um, and I blasted it out. Um, I think we've got like 22 votes at this point. It, you know, it's one of those things where you got to just kind of look for your opportunity. Like I did a survey a while back uh, on the developer console, and I just 
you know, for 45 minutes, probably 20 minutes out of the 45 minute uh, video conference, I was hitting the guy over the head with certification for, <laughs> for uh, other email addresses for certification yeah. results. And, you know, that's kind of what you got to do. Yeah. Um, the other two features, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe a way to reprompt after a video is played because yeah, right be now, yeah, right now, you know, once the video gets finished playing, um, it just kind of shuts off. I mean, it really doesn't, it stays in this sort of like um, purgatory where, where it's still kind of in the skill. And if you say something like, Hey, main menu or this, it will go back to the beginning, but it is sort of like in this like limbo state. And I just wish that they would allow them to, to have a reprompt after a video is finished. And in the third one, uh, I'll just, I, I might have to punt that one back. Uh, I don't think I have a third one. I think those two are my major. Hey, and that's, that's fine. Cause I, I agree with both of those. I think those would be two really good features. And, you know, I think it was a uh, project voice this last year. I attended a session with Mark Tucker and um, a couple of other people and my <laughs> Mark cracked me up because he just had like this running list of features <laughs> for, for Amazon to consider it. It was quite hysterical, but uh, yeah, they hopefully, you know, as, as the technology continues to grow, they'll be able to to add some of these new features and, and other things, but yeah, those, those are, those are two really good ones. I like those. So kind of as we, we start to wind things down, I have, I have two more things, of course, here I'd like, uh, to get your insight on. And then one thing I know we specifically talked about in our, our pre-meeting for the podcast, but what are your thoughts on usability? You know, how do you see voice fitting into the larger accessibility um, community? Um, I think it's going to be huge. Um, I think that, um, I think this is going to provide an outlet for a lot of people to to be self, self-sufficient on their own. Um, one of the individuals that comes to mind is a guy out in uh, England, uh, Christopher Robinson, or Robert Christopherson. I, I forget his name, but he does the Dot to Dot podcast, and he's got a large, a large uh, following. And he reviews skills, and he's primarily blind. No kidding. And, yeah, and I think it's just a, I think it's just a great thing for him to be able to have this avenue and to be able to do that. And think about, think about, you know, think about the visual component. Okay. Somebody who's deaf or is hard of hearing things flash up on the screen. You select them. The answer gets prompt onto the screen. You, you hit more buttons. You know, the, um, I think the opportunities are endless as we start to, as we start to build on this uh, sector of, yeah. of, te- of technology. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And that's one of the first things, of course, I went to as, as we started into this, my, my mind immediately went to the accessibility stuff, but I don't, I don't really know what happened and, and to why we kind of switched there. But I'm, I'm actually quite shocked that, you know, as, as people like you, you know, we talk about how important this is. I, I'm, I find it hard to find really anybody in the voice space working directly with accessibility. And I, I really hope that does um, change into the coming years, because I agree with you, especially for people who are, are blind. I mean, this is, this is just a life changer. Um, you know, the one thing I always wondered, you know, these devices have speakers on them, right? And well, obviously, duh. but, <laughs> but my whole thing is, is that if you created something with Morse code, could you be able to put your hand on there and understand it? From because just if, the, uh, the pressure of the, vi- the audio signal? Yeah, from the vibration. Oh, the vibra- that's a really good idea, actually. Because I think that, you know, even for somebody who's hard of hearing, that could be a game changer. I mean, you're putting the tones out there. It's creating the words, you know. I mean, it would take a lot of work, but that could be a future avenue for accessibility. Absolutely. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's the sky is really the limit when it comes to accessibility, and and, and like I said, I this is a great idea. Like you, you should probably do that, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I could definitely, I could definitely give it a try. <laughs> because like um, I, I just think there is there is such an opportunity for accessibility, and I think you know a company I, like us and others I know, you know, we know that opportunity is there, but unfortunately, it kind of falls back onto those things like, all right, well, who can we target? Where, you know, I there's. Can tell you- I the most revenue right now. right now, unfortunately, that detracts from maybe the, you know, the humanitarian side of this too, which I think there probably at the end of the day is even larger opportunity there. 
Exactly. And I can tell you right now, I wouldn't want to be the guy getting that certification email. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know what would happen? They'd be like, it did not say anything. It just played tones. Oh yeah. Ended. They would, <laughs> they would, they wouldn't know what to do. Even, I think even if there was enough documentation to support what the purpose behind it was, they would probably still be like, uh, what is this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> um, um but yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think the conversation needs to be expanded on usability and accessibility. And I think those who really start focusing on that now are probably going to reap a lot of rewards in the future because they're going to be able to help so many different people. Um, yeah, that's that's my thought on that. And I'm, I'm glad you that's a core component of, of what you believe in terms of, of this technology as well. So again, as we kind of wrap things up here. One question I always like to ask every guest that I bring on the show is what is one thing that you think someone can do today to begin leveraging voice technology, either personally or within their organization? Uh, get out there. Right. So uh, first off it, it, what you want to do is I would say you want to create a skill. If you have a business, if you have a blog, if you have anything that you're doing in any, any sphere of influence, or if not, even in a small, medium, large business, you should at least have a voice component. Even mm -hmm. if it's an FAQ, just do it. You know, it doesn't cost anything to really produce these unless you go out and hire a developer. But get into that field because it's sort of the wild west and you're sort of, uh, you know, um, you're out there uh, claiming, claiming stake to this, to this real estate. And if yours, if you're, uh, you know, big scoops ice cream, you want to make sure that whenever somebody says open big scoops ice cream, that's the skill that they're getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. And this is something I talk about too in the, talks that I give is, you know, now is the time to really just start experimenting and, you know, look internally as to what problems you have, you know, either internally as an organization or with your customers and how voice can solve that. It's definitely a, a bit of a different way of thinking. And I always find that, you know, people in business or in marketing have a really hard time right now wrapping their heads around it. But, you know, really just looking at the problem you're trying to solve, I think, and how, deploying something on Alexa, Google, or maybe even a different voice assistant altogether can solve that problem. And again, I agree with your point, you know, it is relatively cost effective to do this right now, but if you want it done well and done right, then of course you want to consider the developer route or conversation design route with a group of people or somebody like you, Nick, who, who really knows what they're doing here. So I think that's, that's an excellent piece of advice for, for somebody listening to this. Well, it's been an excellent conversation that, that we've had, Nick. I, I really enjoyed talking with you, and I think we touched on some really, really good uh, items here and, and some different pieces of discussion that I, I know are really going to help some of the listeners and really anybody who's listening to this who may not even be in voice and just want some additional info. But if anybody wanted to reach out to you, what are some of the best ways for them to go about doing so? So I am on um, all four of the socials, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, and I'm all, uh, besides LinkedIn, which I'm just Nicholas Saka, um, NES voice skills on all those other ones. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel, like I said, where I do some, uh, video tutorials. And, uh, also, uh, I am the lead, uh, developer for Amazon Alexa for a small company out of San Antonio called Voice Skills Inc., and uh, Voice Skills Inc. was started by Jody Burnett, who's also on LinkedIn. And uh, that's where the component of me designing for small and medium businesses come in. A lot of times whenever you design skills, you know, it's either for personal or you yeah. know, there's a mission. But um, with, through Voice Skills Inc., I was able to elaborate on that and create for those small, medium businesses, real estate agencies, stuff like that. So I owe a lot to the team over there and a lot to uh, a lot to to Jody. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time to, to share your knowledge on the show. And I, I really appreciate it. And I, I definitely know I'll probably be chatting again in the future. Awesome. That's great, Nick. Uh, thanks again for having me on. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to hearing this episode. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nick. Take care. You too. Artificial intelligence, voice recognition, machine learning. Robotics. You've been listening to the Artificial Podcast with your host, Nick Myers. Nick Myers.
Podcasts. To stay up to date with all our latest episodes, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. To learn more about how your organization can benefit by unlocking the power of AI and voice, visit www.redfox-ai.com. Until next time.